Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Geek Warning Podcast brought to you by the Escape Collective, the show where we filter the latest and greatest in the world of bicycle tech to separate the hype from reality. And we also pass along our experience and knowledge to hopefully make your bike as good as it can be. I'm James Huang, and I'm joined here in the studio by my tech editor colleague, Dave Rome in Sydney, Australia. Hi, Dave. Hello. Uh, Dave. I don't know if I am in the studio with you, but... Well, you're, hey, you're in the virtual studio. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We also have... Physically sitting next to me is pro bike mechanic Zach Edwards of the Boulder Gruppetto here in Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Zach. Hello. Uh, Dave, Dave, you combed your hair today. Yeah, I even washed it. I don't know what's happened to me. Weird. Yeah. But then I got shampoo in my eye. So, we'll, uh, yeah, if you see me squinting, it's just happened. It's fresh. Well, that, I guess that's, that's what happens when you, when you wash your hair so infrequently you forget how to do it. Yeah, it seems that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, on today's show, we're going to talk about Cervelo's debut into the e-bike world uh, Strava sliding into your DMs, some interesting sponsorship musical chairs in the pro bike ranks, in the pro road ranks, excuse me. We're also going to debate the merits of fancy pulleys and faster hub engagement on mountain bikes. Uh, we're also going to reveal our favorite mountain bike pedals in our new pick one segment. Dave, we already went over your hair, and I know I usually ask you about tools, mm. seeing as how you're our resident hyper geek in that subject, but you've got your own newsletter on Escape Collective that's called, called Threaded, and for anyone who hasn't yet read the latest edition, or worse yet, hasn't signed up to receive it. Uh, what are they missing this week? Uh, well, this week, nothing. But what they have just missed, uh, which went live last week, was uh, a, a bit of a deep dive on cheap torque wrenches. So, yeah, I had torque wrenches from one from Amazon, an Amazon Basics torque wrench, one from AliExpress, and one from everyone's favorite place of jack stand recalls, Harbor Freight. And yeah, I just compared them and uh, sort of, yeah, gave some opinion on whether any of them are worth owning. So I'd say that's worth checking out. For the too long didn't read version, were any of them uh, any good? The AliExpress one was actually pretty decent. Surprisingly, the Harbor Freight one was accurate. It just was so bulbous and big that you couldn't actually fit it in a lot of places where you need a torque wrench on a modern bicycle. But yeah, it actually wouldn't make your bike combust, which is quite good. <laughs> well, I, I feel partially vindicated. I'm Zach. Cross season is finally over here in Colorado. Does that mean you can finally take a few days off? It's not over. We got nationals this next week. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking. The kids thinking are going here. to Belgium. And- okay, fine. It's not quite over. When <laughs> when are you going to be able to take some time off? Because every time I come in here, you've got a wall of bicycles, regardless of the weather. Yes, always busy. Is that just your life now? That's my life. Huh? It, it's almost like it. It's almost like you're giving hope to uh, to to quality independent bike mechanics everywhere. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, anyway, as much as I want to enjoy this freakishly warm weather we've got going on here in Colorado right now, uh, I feel like my brain's already in winter mode, so I actually haven't been feeling a burning need to ride. Real winter can come any time now. I'm actually kind of ready to ski. I was skiing the other day. It was quite nice. Huh. It was like a foot of fresh snow. Okay. Anyway. I'll be let's waiting dive- a while for that. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to be waiting quite a while for sure. Yeah. Let's go ahead and dive into the news. First up, this was maybe an inevitability, uh, but Cervelo's gotten into the e-bike game with a new model called the Ruvita. Uh, I actually haven't looked up what that means yet, but there are two road and two gravel models built around the same carbon fiber frame. It's got adjustable geometry for what they would consider to be appropriate handling in road or gravel mode. Comes equipped with a Fazua Ride 60 mid-drive motor. It looks actually kind of pretty okay, I think. Uh, I just Mm -hmm. got one in for test a few days ago and built it up. I haven't ridden it yet, but it does look less bulky in person than it does in, than it does in pictures. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly meant for more sporting intentions, I'd say. Uh, the one that I have uh, is built up, built up for gravel. It came with SRAM Force Axis and Reserve Carbon Wheels. It's actually pretty light. It's like 13.4 kilos without pedals. It's about 29 and a half pounds. It's pretty good for uh, a medium e-gravel bike. Prices start at about $6,200 US with Shimano GRX 600 up to 13000 with SRAM Red Axis. So yeah, this is no surprise that Cervelo has an e-bike because that seems like pretty much a requirement these days. Uh, but Dave, I'm kind of curious to get your take on this, given that you just bought for yourself an e-mountain bike recently. So does this does something like this even appeal to you at all? Uh, not for me in Australia, uh, because we have a 25 kilometer per hour speed regulation, which uh, and these bikes, in theory, you can deregulate them, but there's there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't. Namely, if you hit someone and they end up testing the bike you are uninsured at that point but that's my issue for it is 25 kilometers per hour isn't fast enough for it uh for me for a road group i mean you're you're basically then working against the weight of the bike and the motor anytime you're in rolling terrain in in any sort of cycling groups yeah it it helps on the climbs but not really anywhere else and I, i think it's a hindrance everywhere else so that's the limitation if 
in Australia, we had uh, different regulations that allowed closer to what uh, you have in the US, even 32 kilometers per hour, then that's a completely different story. And at that point, I'd be far more excited about the style of bike. Uh, Zach, do you see many e-gravel bikes coming through here at all? Not really. Only on occasion, but for the most part, no. Not really your market, I guess, really. No, I would. I mean, there's like, I would say some like slightly older people that have have them, which totally makes sense. But yeah, otherwise, I don't see too many. My dad's now this customer. He's He's got an e-road bike and Argon 18 and like he absolutely loves it but yeah I do know that that 25 kilometer per hour limitation still still hinders him on lo- rolling terrain and yeah so I mean even in that demographic it's it's still the laws are preventing this category from really taking off internationally um you don't have those limitations in the US so I I could see this becoming quite a a popular purchase item amongst an aging road population <laughs> And yeah, I guess just to clarify, in the U.S., uh, we do have motor assistance certified up to 45 kilometers per hour, which is 28 miles an super hour. Super quick. Uh, yeah, very quick. Uh, and then even in the, I think, EU and, well, EU and UK, I can't remember, if there, there might be some, some specifics for uh, either one of those, but they're pretty close to each other. And those are about 32 kilometers an hour or about 20 miles an hour. Both of those mm-hmm. are much more reasonable speed limits, I think, for something like this. I, I don't know. I don't know about that thirty-two kilometer per hour thing. I think that there's different classes in in Europe now, and they they do have like the speed elec uh, category, which requires a license and a, a number plate, which is closer to the speed you're allowed in the US. But yeah, I think the there's still a lot of it, regions are still on that twenty-five kilometer limit, which is fine for some e-bike styles, but not for a, a road racing styled bike. What I would say is uh, I'm not at all surprised to see Cervelo put its name to this. Uh, no doubt it was a request from its its parent company of, of Pon. And I think that its parent company would be a reason why this bike on its first iteration is probably extremely good, is that uh, that Fazua Motor uh, Focus were actually probably the first in the road market to do a Fazua equipped road bike, carbon road bike at least. Uh, they did that with the Paralene E and that was a good bike. It's been updated since. But yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of experience here uh, within uh Cervelo's grasp that they they can call upon to to have a good go at this and uh yeah it seems like a pretty solid solid bike so yeah it's interesting i mean zach when the last time that i was here you actually showed me a little spy photo that you had on your phone of that Cervelo. Oh. <laughs> yeah um that you found somewhere Maybe but uh people. <laughs> yeah when when, uh, <laughs> when, it, when it showed up the first thing that i thought of when i built it up is like wow this actually reminds me a lot of the original soloist carbon Mm-hmm. Just, you know, maybe not with how narrow that old bike was, but certainly in profile, just like how tall the down tube is. It doesn't look that different, actually. I'm not sure if anyone there was, you know, kind of had that in mind when they were styling this thing. Probably. But yeah, who knows? But I mean, Cervelo is claiming that it actually is kind of arrow-ish. Like they're not really making big claims or anything, but they're they're claiming it's kind of arrow. They said something about like turning the battery on its side or something. But aside from... Th- kind of just like a little bit of the crudeness of how that mid-drive motor unit looks and i guess specifically the the chain ring spider it actually looks quite nice like the display is really well integrated into the top tube all the like the little buttons are hidden and stuff and um i mean we all know my feelings on fully hidden cabling but for a bike like this i think it actually makes sense it does hide all the extra mm. wires and everything I mean, like so many of these other bikes look really clunky with like like that they yeah, like a designed a bike unit. and then the e-bike part was an afterthought and there's all these wires that are like zip tied along the brake hoses and stuff and you're like cool i just spent 12 grand on this bike and it looks like trash <laughs> yeah and, yeah and then and then like in some of those situations like you said there's like a separate display unit uh clamped onto the handlebar and like all these mm-hmm. wires everywhere and extra all these extra buttons and stuff and it looks very very tidy and like i said it, it's quite light all things considered i think it's gonna be pretty fun so i'm gonna check it out pretty soon we'll see we'll see how it goes but does yeah. a quick google and it seems like it's a made up name. The 30 seconds that I Googled what a Ruvita is. And well, that would explain why when I looked it up earlier, nothing really came up. So yeah. I mean, I'm sure it maybe means something somewhere, but from what I could tell, it seems like a made up word. All right. Well, we'll find out how that thing goes. Uh, next up in the news. So we've known for a pretty long time now that bigger rear derailleur pulleys can reduce drivetrain friction by you know, a couple of watts, nothing crazy. Uh, and it's been almost 10 years since Danish outfit uh, Ceramic Speed. They they debuted their original aftermarket pulley cage assembly. So Ceramic Speed recently branched out into mountain bike versions of its whole OSPW thing. They, they branded them OSPWX. Uh, they're trying to kind of have a separate mountain bike range. Uh, and it now has a version, version for SRAM's latest transmission 
electronic mountain bike rear derailleurs. It's got the usual giant 14 tooth and 20 tooth pulley wheels, ceramic bearings. Uh, only this time it comes with a little bit of a twist. Ceramic speed added. No, well, like <laughs> maybe not a literal twist, uh, but okay. ceramic speed has added these little kind of like rifle textures inside the inner diameter of the pulley wheels. And they're saying that these things actively remove mud and debris to keep the bearings clean or help keep the bearings clean anyway. Uh, they even have like a, a rather non-inventive name for it. They just call it active debris remover. Wow. Yeah, very, very clever. So not surprisingly, it is stupidly expensive. It's $670 US for uh, the whole cage assembly and pulleys, whatever. Uh, and that's not even including the donor derailleur itself. Yeah, at face value, it is quite silly, I think, to put it mildly. So I am by no means going to suggest that this is a good value. But uh, Dave, you and I were talking about this earlier. And do you think people might be missing the point a little bit with this thing? Yes. Uh, let me just preface this by saying I do think the price is ridiculous. But I, I think there is a genuine market for this. And I, I don't think it's quite as silly as people uh, immediately assume. So uh, when people see ceramic speed, they immediately think all the gains are from the ceramic bearings, which with the pulley cage assembly, it's not that. It's... The oversized pulley wheels uh, reduce the articulation in the chain, which that's where the big savings are. Uh, and when I say big savings, I still mean one or two watts. It's more than nothing. And, and it is enough that if you have a, a really nicely prepped chain, you can often feel it a little bit like it, it does feel smoother through the drivetrain. But for me, the, the other side of it is that if you were to get any level of transmission derailleur, namely you'd get the GX version because that's actually the most... Uh, up-to-date derailleur with a better battery placement. If you were to get that and you put this cage assembly onto a GX derailleur, all of a sudden you have a derailleur that is within a few grams of the XXSL derailleur, the top tier version, uh, but with a even better, smoother rolling uh, pulley system. Uh, but bigger picture than that, if you think about transmission being the undestructible derailleur that you can stand on, and uh, that you can jump on and that you can hit with a hammer and do everything else on Instagram with. The only weak point of that derailleur is actually the cage assembly. That, that cage assembly is sort of the only thing that I've seen people f having fail where a stick grabs it and rips it free of the, of the rest of the derailleur system, which is incredibly robust and incredibly overbuilt. Uh, and yeah, I think the big thing for me here is that this, this OSPW comes with a lifetime warranty on it, like a kind of like a rider care lifetime warranty so all of a sudden the weakest point of the derailleur now has a a crash replacement policy on it which i think is kind of cool yeah because we have seen i mean zach i don't know if you've seen these come through here but I've, I've certainly seen accounts online of people who have ruined a pulley cage on their transmission rear derailleur and have literally been on the side of the trail like hammering at the thing with with a rock or something kind of like trying to roughly straighten it out so they can keep it going yeah but it unthreads so easily and you can replace the cage so easily it without does. any tools. It does. But that doesn't help you when you're on the trail. No, when you're on the trail, no. <laughs> but get, given the nature of your shop here, well, actually, I'm looking at, uh, I'm actually looking at an OSPW right now. Um, I would have to there imagine you that you have had more than a handful of those things come through here. Yeah. Do you think that there is a market for these for the mountain bike community? I mean, I think on the road side or time trial triathlon side, like for sure it's people do all kinds of silly stuff to save watts. So why not have pulleys that make you faster? On the mountain bike side, I have OSPW on my mountain bike because why not? Is there any noticeable improvement in any kind? Not at all. How um, dare you? I know. Uh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, would I go out of my way to buy one to add it to my mountain bike just because? Probably not. Mm. But like, if you see it as this like val this like performance increase thing, then yeah, it's that's silly. But I mean, it looks cool. This one is more striking. So like, you either like the way it looks or it looks terrible but i think at the end of the day like the oversized pulleys and ceramic speed in general is like a very high quality well-made product like both the bearings last forever stuff's all cnc machined really well it's just a high quality product and you pay for that because it's a small company it's not just yeah. like coming out of some factory where they're pumping out millions of them yeah i mean yeah and that lifetime warranty i i can't undersell that enough i, I feel like that almost justifies the price the watt savings i think are potentially bigger off-road because uh the more friction in your chain the more dirt in your chain the the greater benefit you'll get from those bigger pulley wheels because there's there's less articulation so but the um, i would say know, with transmission though like the new stram like the pulleys are already bigger than what they, they used to are be. big yeah so it's not as big of a difference going to it's not but yeah so i, I feel like the the claim for efficiency gains off-road is 
potentially more likely to be true, if that makes sense. I mean, you should, before you ever do an OSPW, you should be running a wax chain and doing everything else you can. Be, like the OSPW is kind of last on the list of the, the expense to improve your drivetrain. I do feel like off road. It's it the one thing that you can see, so people yes, get it first. That's why, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ooh, um, ooh, I'd good say point. the downside to it though is that uh, bigger pulley wheels mean it's a bigger cage to hit against stuff. So, uh, James, any thoughts on that? Like, how much bigger does it look like? Look, you've you've had one of these in your hands. Uh, you know, I haven't installed it yet though, so it's interesting because one of the things I asked Ceramic Speed before uh, before the thing even showed up was if they also required. Uh, that you run a longer chain, but they said they actually designed the thing that, such that it will run perfectly with the exact same chain length, which I find interesting. So I'm not sure if the axle to axle dimension of the of the pulleys themselves might be shorter than mm. uh, than the regular cage. I need to check on that because I mean that makes sense though, like because transmission it's so particular with chain length, and you have to yeah. look at the chart and t- see what. Yeah, like, that would be a, a real barrier so, to purchase if they'd changed. So the like chain the stream speed would have had to come totally. up with their own. Yeah, like calculator to tell you how long your chain should be. Yeah, so I'm I'm glad that they engineered it that way. Um, so so two things I want to discuss with this. It's just one. My understanding is that this reuses the clutch mechanism off the old cage. I see that as the biggest issue with this is that that clutch mechanism is a wear item. Uh, SRAM do not offer that piece as a service item except for buying a whole cage assembly from SRAM. Um, so in theory, you could buy like a GX cage assembly and take the clutch mechanism off of it to to put on your ceramic derailleur, but uh, ceramic speed equipped derailleur. But yeah, that's that's one issue is that I think that those clutch mechanisms under he- heavy use will probably wear out over <laughs> a couple of years of use. Um, yeah, I mean, the only other thing that I wanted to discuss is Zach brought up uh, before we started recording that the ceramic speed X logo looks a lot like uh, Elon Musk's newly acquired company. Uh, and I, I guess like, to discuss that, uh, like the story I heard is that Ceramic Speed wanted to call it Ceramic Speed Twitter, um, and that name was already taken. So they went with Ceramic Speed X, and then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Elon's just followed them. How many OSPW cage assemblies can you buy for forty-four billion dollars? I think quite a few. Three, <laughs> four, three D printed or no? Oh, good question. Good question. So I wonder, like, would would it have been a better deal for him to buy? Twitter for forty four billion or ceramic speed for forty four billion. Ooh, I mean, either way, he's going to ruin the investment. Let's so <laughs> <that's> move on. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I haven't yet gotten this on my bike, but I'm going to do that pretty soon. So we'll find out how this thing works. Well, hopefully in the next couple of days or weeks, depending on how the weather holds up, we'll see. All right. Last bit of news uh, for our first segment here is uh, we're going to talk about Fulcrum's new Red Zone Carbon Plus mountain bike wheels. Uh, on the surface, they're not insane they're you know less than 1400 grams for a set of two niners which is the only way they come rims are 28 mils wide they have this kind of nifty wavy pattern to them that fulcrum says uh allows for like perfectly even spoke tensions left right so on and so forth given that it's fulcrum they uh the rim's got a solid outer wall so there's no rim tape required for to run tubeless which is great and you also get the the company's i would say pretty highly proven usb hybrid ceramic bearing setup uh they're adjustable it's kind of nice proven anyway yeah. um yeah, yeah. So aside from these being priced at the more kind of premium end of the spectrum, the only major downside, in my opinion, that I can see is the pretty so-so 10 degree hub engagement. But I'm kind of wondering, like for cross-country riding, does anyone really care? I mean, I think, yes, you don't want slow engaging hubs, but like that's the same as what most DT is, a 36 tooth, which is, I would say, pretty sufficient for most riding. For most cross-country riding anyway, that most people are doing. Yeah. I would say with these wheels in particular, not to change the subject, but... They're very expensive. Do they have a rim like crash replacement? Oh, you know, that is a good question. Because for a 1300 gram ish mountain bike wheel, I would not want to buy them if they did not have some sort of replacement policy. I forgot to look into this, but the last time I had this discussion with Campagnolo, uh, which is the same parent company as, as Fulcrum, their response at the time was that they didn't have sort of like a, you know, no fault crash replacement sort of thing. It was more like a it was kind of more like a case by case, we'll take care of you sort of thing. Gotcha. It was rather so nothing vague. official, but nothing official. It sounded vaguely reassuring, but not like super concrete. So that is kind of TBD. But that's clearly not really something that they're not not a performance aspect that they're really pushing with these. Yeah. Um, which, on the one hand, maybe says something to you know to the fact that they're like I guess maybe they're pretty confident in them, but at the same time, it also makes it feel like 
they were like five years behind the times. Yeah. I've, as someone yeah. who's broken a fair number of XC wheels, hmm. I would be hesitant to purchase these. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the customer pays for that warranty in some way or another. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's typically built into the price or, or the company ends up having to add weight to its rims to reduce the number of warranty claims it's getting which I believe has happened in the road space from a certain brand starting with a Z. But uh, it's, um, yeah, I think- Zenvy. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, both Fulcrum and, and Shimano are, are losing probably a lot of sales through that, that lack of warranty. Um, and I think it's mainly just a perception thing. For me, it is a barrier when you're talking about, what is it, $2,500 US set of wheels? Something um, like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, at yeah. The high, it's not outrageous. It, they're not like- 4,000 or something like that, but they're definitely in like 2,500 ish, somewhere around there. Yeah. No, I'm sure these are going to be really nice riding wheels and they'll, they'll work really well. And, you know, the, those hubs are perhaps not the best sealed, historically speaking. Like they, they probably will need routine maintenance, but at least that maintenance is pretty easy. Like you can get, uh, it's a cup and cone system. So you can get straight into the bearing and, and actually take out the bearings, which are in a retainer and you can clean those really easily and grease them. And yeah, the free hub bearings are typically the first thing to go in bookrooms newer hub so uh i would say that's perhaps you know that's that's going to be the the weak point of those hubs but again those those bearings are easily replaceable so uh yeah looks like a solid wheel and i like the the lack of room tapes and a nice feature in the mountain bike space that you don't see too often so all things considered though if you had the option between a slower engaging hub and a faster one would you generally choose the faster one i think i would yeah i think faster degree but i don't think that like I don't know. I feel like so many companies use like fast engagement as a marketing thing, like i9 or Chris King or like, yeah. I don't think that's necessary. Like, you don't need this instant. Like, very rarely are you like ratcheting your cranks to get through like some sort of technical feature. Like, you want quick engagement so that you can get on the gas out of the corner or whatever the feature is, but like, you don't want it to be slow, I think, but it doesn't, yeah, doesn't necessarily need to be this like two degree engagement or something. I mean, I, yeah, I feel like three degrees or so has ended up being kind of my sweet spot. Yeah, I think it's not even like it's one of those placebo things. I think I don't think it makes all that much of a difference unless you're like uh, doing competition trials, something like that. Right. I think it's I don't think there's a measurable performance benefit to having higher engagement hubs. I think it's just the feeling of that rapid, rapid engagement. That's quite enjoyable. It's an interesting question. And I, I I think the, there's also things to consider, which is the downsides, which is, does that higher engagement car, hub come with the, the negative of more friction? Is the design they're using higher in friction? And does that higher uh, engagement point also impact how your suspension action works? All right, well, let's move away from mountain bike stuff just for a moment here. So one thing that was... Well, I guess this can be our on your mind and over the heads of our families segment here, because one thing that I have been wondering about is as we continue to get more press releases about different new gravel bikes, and you know, there certainly has been no shortage of new gravel bikes coming out still. But one thing I have noticed is that there seem to be fewer gravel bikes that seem to like for a while we were seeing bikes that really kind of like pushed the envelope, really had some innovative thinking and like really offered something new and creative for quite a while. And now it seems like things have really plateaued in the tech front with gravel. So I'm kind of wondering, it's, like, have we hit peak gravel? It's almost like the bike industry has a habit of uh, obsessively joining the flock and then oversaturating the market within a certain category to then go on to find the next thing. Huh. Weird. Never heard of that before. Yeah. So like one at one point, uh, I'd instructed my wife at, at, at parties because she really isn't a cyclist and, and always felt like whenever we got onto bike talk, she felt completely out of place. So this is about 10 years ago. I had given her the idea of just to a conversation starter, which was fat bikes are the new fixie. Uh, and it just kicked <laughs> off with bike nerds. It was, it was, it was a, a party hit. So uh, I'm not saying gravel bikes are a fad. I do actually think the category is here to stay. But uh, yeah, I think we have seen the oversaturation already and I think it'll hopefully just slow down a little bit and settle down. Zach, we were chatting about this a little bit uh, before we started recording and you kind of had a little bit more of a competition focused uh, at it, or I, I guess kind of a more of a competition angle toward this, right? Yeah. I mean, I just think like from like gravel riding as a whole, I think is not going away. Like it's a lot of people enjoy getting off road. It's fun. Ride quieter roads. Like 
gravel bikes great in the winter when the roads are crap. But I think from like a professional racing standpoint, like being around some of the at the races this year, it doesn't feel like it's going to be like the kind of racing that is around for much longer. Like it will still be a thing, but like some people love it. But at the high level, most people are like, this isn't bike racing. It's an eight hour time trial. It's not particularly fun or like entertaining racing. It's just like an exercise slog. So that's the the impression I got was like at the high level, it doesn't seem like it'll be around it much longer or like Hmm. not, not, not be around, but not be the, not the hot thing. Yeah. Not the hot thing. Um, I think the other, this might be getting overly skeptical, but if you look at how hot the gravel category was and that the component tree that we're riding in gravel hasn't actually progressed too much past like mountain bike tech from 10 years ago. Uh, like, you know, well, the no, rims that we're uh, running and, uh, I feel like, I don't know, it's like it, the latest and greatest group sets that have all just been released, a kind of recycling of ideas. It's not like there's a huge amount of tech innovation happening that would show you that there's, there's years and years still to come of, of growth in, in a tech space. It kind of, it does feel like it's plateaued. Yeah. To your point, Dave, the thing that struck me was that, you know, as much as we were seeing a whole bunch of pretty exciting gravel bikes and Bikes now are legitimately pretty remarkably capable, but I think the reality is there's only so much room in between road slash all road bikes and cross country mountain bikes from a, Mm -hmm. from a tech perspective, like how much innovation can there really be? Like, I I feel like we've always kind of seen it all. Like a particular, like a specific gravel group set, like SRAM has Explorer, but, and I guess Shimano has GRX, but like Shimano's new GRX uses a mountain bike rear derailleur that says GRX on it. And the mountain yeah, bike is set, a lot and then you look at yeah. all of the top gravel racers and influencers and everyone, they're not running Explorer. They're running the mountain bike rear derailleur with mountain bike cassette and then a one by with a big right. chain ring because you get yeah. significantly more range than you do with Explorer for the high speeds that you would race with. Why would you make an entire gravel group set when the mountain bike one is very close to what you need? So I bring that up not to, not to rag on gravel bikes. I mean, I, I am a big fan of gravel bikes for how much it opens up the sort of terrain that you can ride relative to regular uh, regular road bikes. The advancement in technology in the last five, eight years or so has been pretty remarkable, but it does really feel like we have plateaued. So, yeah. And, and if you look at the next big technology front was going to be suspension for gravel, right? That was kind of the, the exciting space that we had all the- But nobody the wants that. Players. Exactly. Like Nina have just announced that they've discontinued their magic carpet gravel They were bike. still making that? I'm surprised too. The, yeah, the, uh, the MCR has been in production virtually unchanged since we completely ravished it. Panned it. Yeah. At the old place. Yeah. In one of our yeah. reviews. Yeah. And like I rode, say, the BMC Urs LT, which is the one with the little Cannondale esque head shock in the front of it. Didn't like that either. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's kind of, it kind of feels like the suspension thing may not happen. It, it kind of feels like a few brands have tried it and perhaps haven't done a good enough job of it to make a real case for it that it'll truly take off from here. A Fox and RockShox have fine products, but again, it, it makes for a bike that is often heavier than an equivalent hardtail, uh, and that's a tough sell. So, yeah, it does feel like it's plateaued, and it feels like it, in theory, and I'm going to sound very grumpy here, but it plateaued in the same way that road bikes have plateaued. Yeah, that's right? what There's I was... Like so kind many of things thinking you need to do there. is like this is similar to what happened. I feel like in road bikes, like the last five years or something, like they all kind of started to look like a tarmac, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, like right now I've got an MV Mog here, the new Canyon, whatever it's called, the Grail, not the one with the airplane handlebars, but like the new one. And then I've got like a checkpoint here, and they all kind of look the same, like yeah, and have the same features. Yeah, right? it's like they have. Similar tire clearance, they've got mounts, they've got internal frame frame storage, storage, they've got hidden cables, I don't know. They they need to, right? Like, they all need to be derivatives of each other because that's, that's, those are the features that sell right now. Right. And there's not really any requirement to, to be different than that. So, well, uh, yeah. To be clear, I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing. Um, So, I, I don't want, I don't want to give the impression that I want to see new tech just for the sake of new tech. But getting to like a sustainably healthy level, I feel like with this category and with all categories, I feel like which is perfectly fine because I've definitely seven fifty D. Yeah, but I mean, I've, coming. I've definitely had the had the opinion for a long time that road bikes have been seemingly nearly perfect for quite a while now. 
Yeah. And if we are already at a point right now where gravel bikes are at a similar similar level of, of maturity, that's actually kind of awesome. As you said earlier, Dave, it also means that there are probably some companies out there who went a little too gung-ho with how much they were investing into gravel and how much they were banking on that sort of growth and the explosion in popularity and stuff. Things are kind of leveling off already. That's good in some ways, maybe not so good in other ways, but it just kind of just depends on how forward thinking some brands were, I guess. My understanding is that participation in gravel is still growing. Uh, I, I think it's just, uh, it can't boom forever. And I think the boom of it is definitely over. Right. Correct. There's only so many people that want to ride 200 miles across Kansas. Well, <laughs> yeah. And even, even, <laughs> even, <laughs> Not even, uh, or even ignoring that kind of more extreme level of the sport. Like, yeah, I mean, there are still a bunch of people who are probably transitioning from, I would say, road to gravel, maybe not as much from mountain bike to gravel. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be quite as many people doing that. You know, if, if that's where the majority of people riding gravel bikes are coming from, then like at some point you run out of people who are interested in switching over, right? Right. Yeah. Because the bike yeah. industry is notoriously bad at creating new cyclists in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically just speaking to existing customers where the gravel is the gateway for roadies to, to get onto mountain bikes and mountain bikers to get onto road bikes. And it, it does seem to still be serving that purpose. Uh, I think, you know, road, <laughs> this is going to sound, again, I'm, I'm feeling very grumpy right now, but um, <laughs> I feel like the any growth in road at the moment is happening as a result of mountain bikers getting on gravel bikes and being like, oh, drop bar bikes aren't so bad and then buying a road bike. Anyway. You, speaking to the same customers. You are grumpy, Dave. There's, there's something in your shampoo, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I should have got the caffeine <laughs> one from Alpacet. Oh, that's right. Of course. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, shift back to mountain bikes just a little bit here because I think it's time for our pick one category uh, for people who haven't caught the show over the last couple episodes. It's basically where we pick a particular product category and then just sort of reveal our favorites. Unless either of you have a category in mind right now, I'm just going to go ahead and say what I picked was, uh, I'm curious what everyone runs for mountain bike pedals. There's a strong chance that we're all the same. <laughs> okay. Can we, can we yeah. count to three and say it out loud? <laughs> okay. Which one, is the brand? One, two, two three. Shimano. 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 No. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> all right. Well, how about we talk about why that is our common pick? Uh, Zach, why do you run Shimano pedals? Uh, I would say, so there's, they last forever for the most part. There's like a couple of years of XTR that had some issues. Yeah, the bearings the, were a little funky for a couple of yeah, years. Yeah, and like the spindles would come out and yeah, not great things. I had that. Yeah. like Funny story with that. I was testing a $700 mountain bike, 700 retail dollar mountain bike with my $400 pedals on them. <laughs> um, so this is Australian dollars. And it was my four hundred dollar pedals that failed on the ride. <laughs> Great, but like so. Other than that, little like bad production cycle, they last forever. The cleats last forever. They just work. Like it's not plastic, so the shoes don't wear into them, and then they wear out, and then they crack or whatever. Like they just last forever. Like I've got XTR pedals that are twenty years old, and I've got new ones that are great. I've got trail ones that I've bashed into so many rocks, and they still work great. Like the only downside I'd say is for like really, really muddy cross racing, they kind of suck. Particularly if you don't have a B bike and a mechanic in the pits spraying the pedals out every lap. Like that's the only situation where they're really bad. Other than that, it's just like so much more of a solid connection to the bike. Like other ones, they're like, they have a lot of flop around and it's not really a great feel. Yeah. Which you, which they've now often, like if you look at Crank Brothers, they spent a few iterations designing around that floor so the latest version now has these shims that you can put in that that prevent that right but it's still like a plastic wearable part yeah it is um so yeah they've they've spent a lot of effort to try solve uh i guess what is a fundamental issue in their design which some people feel and some others don't it's often comes simply down to whether you get lucky with your shoe and how it engages with the pedal um yeah with crank brothers but yeah uh, an adjustable spring tension is also something that uh, a lot of other brands miss out on. So. Uh, I will say that one of the situations where Shimano pedals definitely don't work very well is in winter conditions like snow and ice. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, granted, that's a very, very niche application. But for when I'm on my fat bike, uh, I do run Crank Brothers there uh, just because they're so much better in those conditions. But otherwise, I run Shimano SPD all the time. Yeah, I was on Crank Brothers for a decade, like from the literal first generation. Oh, yeah. Um, like every, all the every way weight weenie mountain biker and- was. Did you get the yeah. the tie spindles from eBay and they were so light. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
and and yeah, I mean, I grouped out my my fair share of tie spindles <laughs> for the pedals. Uh, and and yeah, like I, it was when I stopped. Uh, at one point, I worked for the distributor in Australia, and and when I stopped working for them, at, uh, I started doing bike testing, and and it was, you know, you'd go do group tests, and everyone else would be on Shimano pedals uh, to save you having to swap around pedals. You, I ended up running the same pedal system as them, and actually never looked back after that. Uh, for me, it was just. Yeah, not having to rebuild my pedals every three months was was quite nice, and yeah, being able to smack the, the pedal on the bottom of a rock and not be ejected from the pedal was also quite nice. Yeah, these days, I mean, I, I have a lot of Shimano pedals, so it would be a very big expense to move to another system. <laughs> but I would say XT is probably the one I'd recommend to everyone. I have XTRs, and no, what they are, are the other ones like the M five forties or whatever. The yeah, silver, M five forties, the really silver good ones well. that still have the. Yep. The, the like, cartridge spindle, the, yeah, the good spindle, not with the plastic yep. cap. Yep, those are the yep. best. So ones. yeah, if you, it's it's worth spending more and getting the M five forty versus M five twenty in that sense. But uh, yeah, the XTs for me is sort of like a slightly fancier, slightly more open design of the M five forty, and I think those are where the the values at because the XTR does have like a Teflon coating on it and it, it engages more smoothly and is a little bit lighter, but they still have that um. The seal still pops out on them for me. I, yeah. I don't know if you experienced that, Zach. Oh yeah, definitely. Annoying, the biggest thing so. I like about XTR is the lower stack lower height. stack height. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. And that's kind of a big deal for us around here, just because we have so many rocks. Uh, like it just gives you the tiny, tiny bit more clearance uh, around here. I'll take every little bit I can get. Oh, look at that! Dave got a shiny new XTR pedal that he just flashed on. <laughs> Seems on like everything here. we talk about, I always just like have <laughs> reach. Weird. Anyway, huh? Uh, well, I would say name something. I'll see if I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that. Uh, that was not the most exciting of pick one segments that we've had since that was basically just like a Shimano SPD love. Pack. I should say I used to really like yeah. Times. Yeah, but you like the shoes. The sole of the shoe would wear into the plastic body, and then mm -hmm. you'd have to replace the whole pedal before like the actual mechanical bits are worn out. And do I am I remembering correctly that Time pedals, uh, the spindles are still not user serviceable? I don't think that they are. Or even if you could get in there, you can't get any parts. That's a huge bummer. Yeah. Because Shimano's are still so easy. Yeah. Hmm. And you can get yep. new spindles and bearings and stuff. And you can like get upgrades if you wanted to, to, to go that route, even if you wanted to. All right. Well. More diverse. Pick one for next time. Yeah. I'm going to have to pick something much more personal, like, like opinionated saddles, grips. You know, what's your favorite? I don't know. Chamois cream. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get more creative. We'll brainstorm. We'll hopefully come up with something a little bit more exciting for <laughs> next week. You guys do like tires or something. That's favorite mountain bike tire. Oh, that tires would be, would be a very, good one. Very opinionated, but it's also so. Mm. <laughs> Everyone's where gonna you be live. like me and DHF. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> All right. Anyway, moving on. That'll do it for pick one this week. Dave, are you testing anything fun at the moment? Uh, yes, but nothing new compared to what I was testing last week. So I am, I would say I'm, I'm more than three quarters done with my Tarmac review now, SL8. Uh, there's a bit of pressure on that bike because uh, it's, it's very good and I don't want to come across like I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm given in to their white paper. Dave, I'm a little terrified at how long this review could be given how long you've been working at it. So hopefully you haven't been actually writing this whole time because it's going to be like, no. 14,000 words or something. Yeah, I, I'd like to think it's going to be shorter than Ronan's uh, Super 6 review. <laughs> <laughs> Very long. Uh, Very highly but, detailed, though. But what's helping me is that I've already written the build report article, which came out when the bike re was released, and I'm kind of just now writing the expansion pack to that. So that's helping me. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, funny thing is one of the, I, I guess the bike that is kind of most interesting on my list right now that it, that just came in a little while ago is at the complete opposite end of that pricing spectrum. I just brought in a, a Trek Marlin 7. Sweet. Uh, which retails for the whopping total of $9.99 US dollars. Uh, and I actually tried to get the Marlin 8, uh, which is a little bit nicer, a little bit more expensive. It was like $1,300 or so. But I've been wanting to bring in kind of a, a inexpensive aluminum hardtail for quite a while just to kind of see where that part of the market is at these days because it's been a few years since i've really looked at these bikes and on the one hand they don't they haven't really changed that much i mean this one has a pretty basic rock shocks judy fork coil sprung steel stanchions wire bead tire stuff like that you know square sp square taper spindle on the crank set it's quite heavy square taper square taper oh well that's why i wanted to get the marlin 8 but they didn't have any so i settled for the 7 anyway 
it's fairly well equipped, all things considered. Getting like Shimano, I think it's a Dior uh, one by uh, drivetrain. Uh, one by with square taper. That's one wild. by with square taper. Indeed. indeed. Wild times. Your, your, your mind is blown <laughs> here. But yeah, it's quite, it's quite heavy. Doesn't come with a dropper at all. It has routing for a dropper at least. What really drew me to that bike was that the geometry is actually quite modern. Um, mm-hmm. Trek did a really nice job on that. What surprises me is how consistent that category has been for spec to price point. For a long time. I mean, they time. have gone up in price. Uh, they have gone up in price as has everything. But that spec, other than ignore the, I say ignore it, but these are the two most important factors, but ignore the 29 wheels <laughs> and the geometry, which arguably don't add cost to the bike. At least the geometry changes don't. But uh, ignoring that, that spec sounds incredibly similar to what that bike would have been 15 years ago. Yeah, really not all that different. Like, I mean, it, as far as features go, does like, it have did have axles? hydraulic disc brakes on entry-level mountain bikes. Through axles? You had square taper. Oh, that's the big downside of this bike. That is the big one, because this one is actually quick release. Ooh, front front yeah, there you rear. go. It's the same bike from 15 years <laughs> ago. It's with, just with new geometry, geometry and bigger wheels. <laughs> uh, yeah. although it, and, and, f- and no front derailleur. Can you, which can is you good. please take this to OHB and just... I don't just destroy it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take it somewhere for sure. I've already converted the wheels to tubeless because that was an obvious necessity for testing around here. Uh, I with with YB tires, you able to do that? Uh, yeah, it's sealed up just fine, actually. Okay. Um, so okay. I'm not sure if Trek actually officially approves those tires for use tubeless. Yeah. But, uh, if I remember correctly, when I was making the swap, the bead did look like it was tubeless compatible and sealed up just fine. So uh, I got a very satisfying pop uh, when I was seeding everything. So you might get a much, a much more satisfying bang. <laughs> <at some point. laughs> Hopefully not. We'll, we'll see. I'm going to, I'll bring spare tubes uh, and maybe a mouth guard. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I am going to find out how this thing does. Uh, I'm going to put a dropper post in it first because that for me is definitely a requirement. But uh, yeah, aside from the key, aside from the quick release thing, front and rear, I'm 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 optimistic of what this thing could be, given that it has good yeah. geometry. Because for me, I feel like the geometry is almost the most important thing of anything. 100. Um, yeah, yeah. So no disagreement there. Yeah, curious to see what happens there. So stay tuned. It's very pretty too. It's a nice little shade of baby blue. All right. Well, uh, last couple tidbits of news. So you're all up to speed here. Dave, what is going on with the latest with Wiggle? Uh, they have announced that they, uh, it seems, I mean, it's bad news for them and it, it doesn't sound like they're necessarily finding a buyer to take over, but they're, they're basically restructuring and becoming a UK only business. The Wiggle and uh, the Wiggle that we once knew as being what was claimed to be the world's largest international online bike shop is, is no more. Uh, yeah, they're basically shutting down e-commerce internationally and, and will refocus on the UK for now. I mean, that is a... Feels big. That's an absolutely shocking turn of events. Do we have any word on what's going to happen with Chain Reaction? Uh, I have not seen confirmation that I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to make a, an assumption, which I hope is correct here, which I believe they have shared logistics with Wiggle uh, in terms of warehousing and, that, and, the, and the like, so... Uh, my belief is that chain reaction cycles would be a similar story, it, but it, it seems like it would have uh, to be to be confirmed. Uh, I mean, I'm personally a little bit confused still as to why the two of them exist separately at all. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of a branding. Chain reaction cycles is kind of the mountain bike arm, and then Wiggle was more the multi sport, you know, triathlon, road, running. Um, so yeah, I think they did have slightly different branding strategies. Uh, it has gone on like that for many, many years, which I'd say it lasted that that split brand lasted longer than I had expected. My goodness. Well, uh, unfortunately, the bad news keeps coming there, but hopefully they can at least find some stability, I guess. Uh, and hopefully they can stop the bloodletting as far as uh, as far as redundancies and go uh, and, and, mm. and related go over there. So I will continue to keep an eye on this one, see what happens uh, on more positive news. Uh, the Made Handmade Bike Show has announced its dates for the 2024 event. It's going to be August 23rd to the uh, to the 25th. Still at the same venue on the waterfront in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so, Dave, you and I both went to the inaugural event last year, and I think we can both agree it was pretty this awesome. Year. Sorry, sorry, yes, earlier this year, excuse me. Um, mm. And I think we can both agree it was pretty awesome. Uh, it was highly recommended that people attend this one. I, I certainly hope to attend yeah. again this year, Dave. I hope you can join me again. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And I would say if you're anyone that 
has a love for bikes and has a fascination of the the Hatton built scene, then it's it's absolutely worth a worth a trip to get there. Zach, is this something that you would ever want to go to? Yeah, I mean, I've been to Nabs a few times, and it was always super cool. So I'd imagine this is similar. I hope they get a big fan in that venue this year. It was warm. They had some fans. Uh, I think they hired fans uh, on day two after we left of, of this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it was pretty hot in there for the first day or two, but uh, cool venue. It was cool. Maybe not literally cool, but pretty cool. No. <laughs> All right. Strava. Uh, everyone's heard of Strava. I'm sure they just added a messaging function to their app. Uh, so if maybe you have, if you've got some questions about a ride or route that someone posted, you can now ask that person about it directly, assuming they haven't turned that function off. Uh, so kind of neat. I mean, this isn't the first time that Strava has dabbled with the idea of kind of incorporating more social media sort of features, but this... I don't know, it might be worth a, a, a chat with Strava at some point to see where they are going with this, see if they are kind of pivoting yet again. But I don't know, the addition of a, of a direct message function actually seems like it might be a good idea. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think how they've implemented it might be problematic because my understanding of it is, is that the default is that anyone that follows you can message you. Um, so that I mean, that would make be, sense. Yeah, uh, it makes sense. But uh, yeah, I guess for... For some people, it might uh, it might lead to, I guess, unwanted messaging. So, uh, anyway, it's perhaps worth checking your settings. And if you don't want messages, then you might have something to change now. Hmm. Well, uh, on the pro road front, uh, the AG2R pro road team, they just announced the move from BMC to Van Rysel bikes from French outdoor mega retailer Decathlon. Uh, and Total Energies mm-hmm. is now going to be on bikes from US brand Envy. So that news isn't exactly groundbreaking in and of itself, but I am very curious what these moves indicate for what the intentions of these two brands might be moving forward. Because, you know, right now, Envy, really the only road bike that they have is the Melee. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I don't know, are they going to continue to expand their high-end road segment? Because I can't imagine Total Energies is going to have just the one bike. I mean, it's a pretty, it's, it's no different than like quick step only having a tarmac. Yeah, true. It's like that kind mm-hmm. of do everything road bike. And I think too, like, it seems like they're wanting to make a big push because like they already support uh, UAE with wheels and cockpits. So that's pretty big. Um, and that's just getting, getting their frames in the Peloton as well. Yeah. It's very, it's what's, what that sponsorship signs is that they're, they're, they're taking the bike category very seriously as a, for the future of the MB brand. Like they, they want to become a, Almost a bike a brand. Service bike brand. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would liken them most similarly to probably Cervelo's trajectory in that sense. But yeah, it's, uh, I think that's, that's the sign. And it perhaps gives you indication of what some future bikes might end up being. Like they probably need to now have a time trial bike. So I think that's perhaps worth keeping an eye out for because they don't have one. The only thing I find a bit odd is the team choice. Like I know that it's hard to come across a team that needs a bike, but like, yeah, it's a very French team. Yeah, I mean, there's, I guess, yeah, in, in some cases, there's only so many entry points into yeah. into this level of racing and uh, MB being an American company probably wouldn't have too many choices with finding a an American team. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's it's probably, a, you know, the right price, the right time kind of deal. As for Van Rysel, I mean, that's, that's a, again, that's just another sign of, yeah, big budgets having, you know, wanting to grow the presence of, of that, of that brand and wanting to, yeah, grow the prestige of that brand, and I think it'll probably work out exactly how Decathlon needs it to work out. I would have to imagine that sponsorship came with a rather large check from Decathlon, too. For sure. So, uh, yeah, also on the, those bikes is uh, Swiss side wheels, which we haven't, I don't believe we've seen in the World Tour before. Uh, we've seen, potentially, DT Swiss wheels designed by Swiss side previously, but not Swiss side. And, uh, and then the other big thing is that AG2R was the last standing hope of Campagnolo being raced within a World Tour team, and that is no longer the case. So Campagnolo is out of the World Tour in an official capacity. Which is really sad. It just it also is. feels yeah. like they've just been like two steps behind everyone. Though. Well, I, I mean, it's really sad. I'm not going to say that it didn't seem like it, it was an eventuality. Yeah. Um, I think many of us could have seen this coming. Um but it still nevertheless is sad, particularly considering that Campagnolo is a brand that has so 
heavily built its identity on professional road yeah, racing. Yeah, like they, they are road racing, right? Like they, yeah. they have a gravel group set now, but like they are road racing. Yeah. I mean, certainly more so than any other component brand out there. They, they hang their hat on one discipline. So yeah, it was it was a surprise to learn that news, and obviously they haven't they haven't sponsored a women's world tour team for many years. Dare I? I'm not going to say ever, but it's it's been quite a few years that they have. Uh, and no, they definitely used yeah, to. Yeah, I think There's, they definitely used to, but it's been at least yeah. two years since with without them doing it. Uh, they're just down to pro team level basically. Um, and I'm not entirely sure who they'll be linked with in that capacity, but. What I'd heard for the reasoning is that they wanted to to be with teams where product development feedback could be more easily attained, um, and that can be quite difficult from a world tour level. But yeah, speaking of group sets in the world tour, uh, rumors, all the rumors are pointing to uh, Bora Hansgrohe, where Roglic's just ended up on, um, that they're going to be riding SRAM next year. So SRAM's adding a, a fourth team to its men's world tour roster, and I think there's six teams in the women's. Uh, SRAM have not confirmed that, but they, they have teased that there will be an announcement in January. Dave, I can't remember if this was something that we had discussed in our internal Slack channels or if this was on Discord or whatnot, but uh, I know that there was some mention somewhere that uh, SRAM seems to have a little bit of a history of ramping up their pro team sponsorships. Oh, yeah. Right before- I wrote it, that in my article. Oh, okay. That's what it was. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Seem to have a, a habit of ramping up their pro team sponsorships right before launching something big. And we are due yeah. for a new red group set, aren't we? Red in its current capacity is the oldest road group set that SRAM has. So it's uh it only makes sense that something new is coming. So yeah, if you combine that with their their ramping up of sponsorship, it kind of leads you to believe that twenty twenty four might be the sign of a new group oh, set. Oh, it's gotta be for sure. I mean we're Bora Shimano sponsored before or because they were on Revolve mm-hmm. Heels too. Or they were. They? they were officially Shimano. They were, yeah. okay. So yeah, Shimano still keeps a handful of uh, officially sponsored teams, but as per usual, they also have a, a lot of teams riding their stuff that they don't have to pay for. So, you know, often supplied by the bike brand. So yeah, Shimano is pretty fortunate in that regard, whereas it does seem like Tram and Campagnolo need to pay for their presence. 2024 is definitely going to be interesting. We, we'll see what happens there, but I would bet that SRAM is going to have a new group set next year. Seem, seems mm. the same. Like, weren't there some like patent drawings floating around not that long ago? There have been, but you know, you never know when the timing of that, all that stuff's going to work out. But uh, it does really feel like we're going to see something in 2024 for from SRAM. So stay tuned for that one. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Um, all right. Well, that'll do it for this week's edition of Geek Warning. Just as a reminder, this show, as well as everything else we do here at Escape Collective, is currently funded entirely by our members. Uh, and well, you not only get a big old pile of awesome podcasts in return for your small monthly fee, you also get a bunch of exclusive members only podcasts like Ronin's performance process and our, uh, geek warning bonus episodes, uh, with that membership, you get access to all of our incredible written content and an invitation to our kind of rather impressively warm and fuzzy discord community. Mm. You also get a good feeling for supporting independent journalism. Along with all the other stuff. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. Maybe not, maybe not an actual physical hug, but you do get high fives whenever we see you out in public somewhere. Do, do lifers get hugs? I think so. If they're, if they're huggers. Oh, okay. I'm not sure we wrote that yeah. into the they contract. Can, I think if they initiate the hug, we'll give them the hug. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, well, we are actually running a special right now. So uh, you can also get your first month of membership for just uh, $1 or one pound or one euro, wherever you happen to be. Uh, just head over to escapecollective.com slash join and then enter in the promo code podcast in all caps when you check out. Uh, yeah, it'll get you all that stuff for just a buck for your first month. If that is still too much to ask, still too much to ask, uh, at least do us the favor of leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. Surely you can do that for us. All right. Well, that is it for real now. And unless any of you had anything to add, we'll see you next week for another episode of Geek Warning. Cheers. Bye. Right.